Hello and welcome back to the recording on the history of Protestantism with your host, me, Brett, here in the United States. And we also have Brother Michael there in Germany. And we are gathered here together on, oh, it's, uh, I forget what day, oh, this uh, 25th of November. And, uh, yeah, this is going to be um, an interesting discussion and reading of the book because uh, it's been several years since I was looking at doing more of this reading in this book. and. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a window of opportunity that we can open and go into this because I think that there's a lot of important history here that uh, I need to study as well as you know many others. And um, it, I think, Michael, this is not going to be a popular topic at all. It's going to be very, uh, what can we say, narrow, perhaps. What do you think, Michael? Hi, Brett, and thanks for the invitation. I'm just here to improve my basic English skills. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that this is printed in Arabic uh, letters here, and uh, because I was used to uh, read it in old German letters sometimes uh, five years ago when I started doing recordings. Uh, so therefore, it's just easy to read, and uh, thanks also for enlarging it. Okay. Yeah, what do I think about it? I think that Protestantism in itself was never a very popular topic. I think that the majority of people actually in the Middle Ages, when it was much more popular than today, mm -hmm. they just joined joined uh, this uh, movement mm -hmm. uh, because it was prosperous. I don't think there were so much uh, real Protestants. I think yeah, it's that interesting you you say that because you know if you look at history, uh, what was it, uh, King of England, uh, Henry the Eighth, was it? Mm, might be, yeah. Uh, Henry the Eighth. Yeah, it's some very interesting history. I mean, uh, you know that whole issue with his wife and not being able to produce a son for you know the throne, so he had to. Uh, renounce the whole uh, papal court and get rid of them and become Protestant in order to uh, get divorced. So it's just interesting how things work out uh, in that sense, even though, you know, um, there are a lot of people that only join in because it's popular or it's, uh, you know, "Quote unquote exciting at the time, um, but yeah, Protestantism. You know what we're going to learn about it here is uh, is truly unique. Well, let's go back another paragraph here and just warm up to uh, where we were. And uh, Michael, you can just interrupt me at any time if you have any comments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's true, no doubt, that Protestantism, strictly viewed, is simply a principle. It's not a policy. It's not an empire having its fleets and armies, its officers and tribunals, wherewith to extend its dominion and make its authority be obeyed. Oh, and that reminds me of, of this... Uh, this uh, scripture that I wanted to bring up today, and I'm really glad that that came about, because usually I was telling Michael I like to start the session with scripture, and um, yeah, we had gotten a little off topic here, uh, and um, I had completely forgotten about doing that. So let's go to Proverbs 6, and... Um, I just really quickly get into this a little bit. Um, let's see. I can't remember exactly the... Uh, yeah, Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of, inst of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So here we have God's word 
God's law is so important for us, but yet, you know, I don't know about you, Michael, but I'll tell you, uh, I had a really hard time in the past even getting a grasp on why the Bible is so important. And I'd always really wanted to study it, but starting out in the Lutheran Church was uh, indeed awkward to say the least, because most of the people that I studied with when I was young didn't really have the interest that I had uh, in the subject, and they were more interested in, oh, however you might, you know, maybe going to school or studying something else uh, other than the Bible. But to me, I've had a very special place always about it, and, uh, you know, through my experiences, have uh, learned that uh, things aren't necessarily as easy as you think in terms of uh, getting a grasp on w- what God is really trying to show us. So, yeah, prayer is definitely needed to... Um, what What is that, Michael, to give maybe give God notice that, you know, maybe you can show me something in my life where I can start recognizing better where I'm going, how I came about to, uh, you know, have this desire to learn. And, you know, this is just so simple. The the commandment is the lamp. It's God's commandment. He's commanded us to do things in the scriptures. And his law is the light. So, to me, that's just so important to grasp, is that we need to obey his commandments, because if we obey the, the world if we obey, you know, the the laws of man, that puts us in direct opposition to where God wants us to be. And, of course, there are circumstances where you need to, quote-unquote, act in this world in order to have, um, you know... um, how can I say it? You you have to uh, you have to obey the traffic, you know, laws as well. I mean, you you can't just run around, um, uh, getting yourself in trouble every everywhere you go. I mean, there are people that do, but anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because I think this is this is a very very important principle, and it has to do also with you know the the teachings of the uh the what what would we say the um the forfeit or i mean it's not forfeit um ah what is it um the imposter the, you know the imposter is the devil. I mean, he wants to sit in the place of God and take the throne of God and call himself God, and he wants to do it in the church. So he did, and it's in history, but, you know, today we've been taught to ignore all that, and that's kind of the problem that I see. But anyway, Michael, uh, yeah, it is true, no doubt, that Protestantism strictly viewed is a principle. It's not a policy. It's not an empire having its fleets and armies, its officers and tribunals wherewith to extend its dominion and make its authority be obeyed. It is not even a, ch- a church with its hierarchies and synods and edicts. It is simply a principle. But it is the grand, uh, greatest of all principles. It is a creative power. Its plastic influence is all-embracing. It penetrates 
into the heart and renews the individual. It goes down into the depths and by its omnipotent and noiseless energy vivifies and regenerates society. It thus becomes the creator of all that is true and lovely and great, the founder of free kingdoms, the mother of pure churches, the globe itself it claims a, as a stage not too wide for its manifestation of beneficent action, and the whole domain of terrestrial affairs it deems a sphere not too vast to fill with its spirit and rule by its law. Whence came this principle? The name Protestantism is very recent. Okay, that was in 18... Uh, 60s, 70s, I forget, I think it was 1870s that this book was written. And uh, now we're another 150 years, 170 years down the line. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, as I said, I think that uh, Protestantism was just uh, a small fire. Um, but people, they were just uh, kind of uh, opportunists. You see that they would engage in the things that have been, been commanded by the governments or authorities, or maybe by the clerical guys and churches then, also especially in England then. But uh, I have a hard time imagining that these people actually were reading the Bible. I think this is just much more opportunism uh, in it. And uh, I think that's also the problem with it. Um, Jesus said you can't obey two masters. And mm. um, I think that the majority of people will always obey a mammon. Mm -hmm. Well, double mindedness as well. Mm. You know, we're supposed to be uh, single. And mm. that's something. Or luke lukewarm. You see that at yes. least then lukewarm people. Then. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, 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 you said before that you could not engage in your church because the majority of people they were just into, let, let's say, socializing. Yeah, I think that that's the majority right. of people that just try to to see uh, church gatherings uh, as as kind of socializing. Yeah, you do it because it is socially accepted, and you just uh, stand out of the crowd and said, "Ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to church on Sunday," or what, what else. And my uh, a relative of mine who has a, a official function in the Roman Catholic Church, where I have uh, left the Roman Catholic Church when I was twenty something, mm -hmm. so thirty years ago. She always uh, tried to engage me in her uh, socializing at the uh, Catholic Church uh, because they were just then gathering around and they were just much, much more uh, playing the guitar and singing songs and all the stuff. And I was just once, and I was 15 or 16 years old, I was just once there gathering. And uh, it was so... Uh, and now we have to be happy. <laughs> It yeah. was. It was. It. It. It was not. A, it, it was like staged. Uh, I didn't feel. It. It. It felt artificial. You see that yes. I did not. Yes. Uh, I could not. Uh, could not get any grasp of it, and I didn't want. I didn't like the Catholic Church from the beginning. Yeah, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I just tried it out and I just met the people. They were all very nice, but it is so superficial, you see. It's it's totally superficial. Right. They have they have even in Germany they have their their uh Kochbüchlein, so their 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 books with all these Catholic songs in it. Yeah. So it has not nothing to do with the study of the Bible actually. It's just a social gathering. That's what I would like to add then. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so whence came this principle? The name Protestantism is very recent. Well, somewhat recent. The thing itself is very ancient. The term Protestantism is scarcely older than, yeah, 15, what, 1517. Yeah, or 1529, they say here. It dates to the protest which the Lutheran princes gave in the Diet of Spires in 1529. Restricted to its historical signification, Protestantism is purely negative. It only defines the attitude taken up at a great historical era by one party in Christendom with reference to another party. But all this, but had all this, had, excuse me, but had this been all, Protestantism would have had no history. It had been purely negative. It would have begun and ended with the men who assembled 
at the German town in the year already specified. Yeah, Michael, and I had asked you last session about what your thoughts were on, you know, this purely negative aspect of Protestantism. And I'm assuming you've had a week to think about it. And, uh, I, you know, I got my take on it, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, it seems like a teacher-pupil situation now. <laughs> mm, what do you mean? Yeah, you you just you told me that I had one week to think about it uh, as as if it would be a kind of a homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's not necessarily that it's homework or anything. It's just that you know uh, I've read this book a long time ago, and mm -hmm. well, not all of it, of course, but the introduction, of course, and. Um, I always just think, well, you know, Luther, he uh, saw it um, in a biblical sense, of course, right away, and he knew something was far, far off, and this is the church, right? Mother church, holy church, you know? He felt the need to reform the church, and, you know, by the end of his life, obviously, he couldn't reform anything, and he was very, very, very upset with the way the direction the church was headed. And, of course, they formed the Jesuit order to counteract uh, not just Luther, but everyone else, correct? Yeah, but I think that, you see, if, if Luther really understood the Bible, which is to be presumed, then it's absolutely clear that it's just a mortal wound. It seems to be a mortal wound, but it wasn't. So what's the point in Reformation? I think that he served his point in history, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, frankly spoken uh, uh, to the point. But the majority of people are still in the Antichrist spirit. So what's, what's there to reform? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see, the, the Protestantism against the Pope is not what the biblical sense of eternal life would achieve. What's it, what's, what the goal in Christianity is, that you have everlasting life because you believe in the... Um, in, in, the, 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 uh, in the only begotten Son of God, which mm -hmm. is the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But it's not that you protest against the Pope for any reason. I think that you have to dif differ between, I think. It's it just for me, it is just okay, because uh, I'm just uh, protesting the Pope, because I know that he's in the seat of the Antichrist. But uh, uh, just protesting the Pope, just to be the Protestants against somebody, uh, is not necessarily uh, the path to salvation. And I think that's the, the, that's the thing that many people um, have a hard time with. The, you see that all the Protestants against something, you have to offer the people something in a positive way, not only to protest against something, but to give them an alternative to the current situation. And the only alternative in the Bible is just the absolute faith in God and His only begotten Son. But as the majority are on the broad way leading to destruction, what what's to achieve in a reformed church? Because, you see, the majority of people will still be on the broad way. So this is the church for the broad way. So therefore, you won't change anything at all. Uh, because the majority of people, they won't listen to you because they can't. They'll be blinded by the God of this world, Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. So what is there to reform? Well, that's a good question. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, Luther was a Catholic. He was trained mm -hmm. in Catholicism. He had all the tradition. Uh, you know, all of the teachings, and he was going to uh, um, study, he was studying this, you know, wasn't he, wasn't he studying law at the time? Wasn't that it? I think that he was an Augustinian monger, but what he studied, I do not know. But you see that I think that maybe in the beginning, he wanted to reform the church. But I think that if you if you are deeper and deeper deeper into the subject, you will see that you can't reform from the church because that church there serves a certain purpose and that won't never end until Christ will return. Yeah, that's correct. But the thing of it is, he was caught off guard, and he had no idea that what he would do would perhaps you know uh, 
become such a big, uh, mm. a big deal. And you know, I mean, this is just one guy, right? I mean, it's it shouldn't be. Uh, I think what really what was going on, of course, is the the papacy was at such a huge uh, advantage. Um, in you know truly usurping the power that Christ has bestowed upon his people, taking that and twisting it to his advantage, of course, with indulgences. And this is the main thing that, that Luther protested against. And the people just instantly knew, of course, when they studied their Bibles at the time, that you know this this whole system of worship is uh, completely wrong. So it, yeah, it just completely I, erupted into violence. Yeah, I totally agree to your biblical standpoint, but I think that for the majority of people, let's face it, they were just protesting the Pope. That's my. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gut feeling. They sure. were just protesting the Pope because of uh, the the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church as being landowners and being just uh, obliged to pay fees and all the stuff. Because the original protest from the ninety five thesis of Luther, they were against these what is the diligences or what uh, uplus uh, these uh, just uh, to pay money to uh, for the path to salvation so it is a, it's also about money and i think that's that's what the key subject is to the majority of people in the middle ages to protest against the pope could be some kind of uh, development out of magna carta and all the stuff where uh, nobility and all the stuff they didn't want to share anything with the papacy anymore so i think that is a major part in it that you see the reformation as also a tool for the people to get rid of the taxes of the Pope and then have the illusion uh, that they can trust their governments, their yeah. so-called democracy. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And that's what we're facing today. So, yeah, that's a really good point, Michael. Very good. Is, uh, you know, we've been fooled and tricked into thinking that, uh, yeah, the government can save us. Or, you know, if we... Uh, if we represent the government correctly, that we can make this go. Um, and yeah, there might be some some truth to it, uh, because you know you have to stand your guard as um, as a watchman. And if you if you look at it that way, Michael, if you are um, taking office and um, you are looking at just you know being a watchman at at work, uh, doing your job, fulfilling the role, uh, you know, in the government. Uh, that's another thing, because uh, you know that's that's God to judge us. It's not man. Man can't judge uh, the the uh, salvation. Okay, that's that's for the Lord. In the Lord alone, He's He's the one that works with us, and we work with Him, and we're all the independent on that. And you know, it's like that that principle: judge not, lest ye be judged. And and I stick to that because uh, you know we're not appointed. Yeah, I I, I've, I, I, I've, I see it, Michael, that we're not appointed. It's not like the Lord. Oh, the Lord took me aside and said, "Yeah, Brett, you are appointed to be the judge over Christendom." No. Yeah, I, I understand your point and admire your position because of a Bible believing Christ, a Christian. But uh, brother, but that the point is for me, for the majority of people, they don't care. The only thing they care is for food, for money, for luxury, for uh, what else to be comfort comforted or what else? Yeah, what you're talking like about feeding it? your belly and and also yes. um, having being let uh, being. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers yes, of God. Yes, and when, and when then the ruler, the the emperor, whosoever, then tells, okay, now the no the new doctrine of the state is then a reformation against the pope, and and we do not obey, and what else? They will follow because they are just only interested in their belongings. But uh, these are not real Protestants. No, as well of course as, not, because you're you're looking at that principle of simply the flesh. If those that are born of the flesh are flesh, and those that are born of the spirit are spirit, so there's a big yeah, but, division here. 
Yeah, but then it's just simply maths, <laughs> mathematics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when the majority of people are still in the Antichrist spirit, then every reformation of any church is totally futile. Mm -hmm. Because the the amount of people who are then the be the elected or the reborn or the chosen one or whoever you like to name it will stay the same because it is not their decision but God's decision. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're speaking of different things, and we have to understand. I think that, that the majority of people that do not care and they can't understand it because they are blinded by the God of this world. Mm -hmm. So they will follow their ruler at ruler at any cost because that's the most convenient and opportunist uh, decision they can make. They just want to. Uh, um, have their property and they just want to have a loan and they just want to have their money and they're just it, it, it's just only this worldly stuff that people are interested in so the what i would like to say to sum it up in one sentence is <clears throat> there is only a minority of people who is on the narrow path mm -hmm. and people who are on a narrow path maybe they would have to have some tool like the Bible being translated in your mother language mm -hmm. to find the truth, to see the light, finally. So that is God's present for the for the elected people. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of people, I'm so sad to say this, but I don't, it, it just does not make any difference if you are living in a Protestant country or in a Catholic country, because it's just a matter of faith, but yeah. they don't have any faith except in themselves. Well, see, that's the thing, okay? So when you study history and you study these uh, literary movements, you see the uh, decline, the real decline of any kind of, uh, uh, what can we say, uh, definitive forms of language and of uh, appreciating it's the simplicity of things. This has all been done away with. We have a very sophisticated, very aggressive world we live in today that just cannot tolerate uh, this, these kinds of uh, um, historical uh, discussions. So they just sweep them all aside and uh, justify all of it. But anyway... Uh, should we get back to the reading, Michael, or is there anything more you want to say? No, no, no. I just, I just want to make my point. There is no need of reformation of the Roman Catholic Church because it is the church for the people on the broad way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And that's the, the <clears throat> thing is uh, at the time, of course, of Martin Luther was much, much different. Uh, there wasn't any sensationalism, Okay. There wasn't any literary movements. They had only just come out with the printing press. And of course, the Bible came along. And it was the most printed book ever. Ever since. Yes, guess, why they, guess why they came up with that internet to destroy all the books. <laughs> well, that's Satan's work, isn't it? Satan's the liar. Yeah, so here's the back to the history of Protestantism. The new world that came out of it is the proof that the bottom of this protest was a great principle which it has pleased Providence to fertilize and to make the seed of those grand, beneficent, beneficent and enduring achievements which have made the past three centuries, speaking of 1870, in many respects the most eventful and wonderful in history. The men who handed in this protest did not wish to create a mere void. They, If they disowned the creed and threw off the yoke of Rome, it was the mighty plant, a, excuse me, that they might plant a purer faith and restore the government of a higher law. See, that's where we're getting to. They replace the authority of the infallibility with the authority of the Word of God. Yes, sola scriptura, right, Michael? And the long and uh, dismal obscuration of centuries, they dispelled that the twin stars of liberty and knowledge might shine forth and that 
conscience being unbound. See, that's the problem today, Michael, is uh, (laughs) conscience. We have cases of conscience. This is the Jesuits' work. Okay, let me go back here. The long and dismal obscuration of centuries they dispelled, that the twin stars of liberty and knowledge might shine forth that conscience being unbound, the intellect might awake from its sleep, its deep solemnity, excuse me, and human society, renewing its youth, might, after its halt of a thousand years, resume its march towards its higher goal. We repeat the question, whence came this principle? And we ask our readers to mark well the answer, for it is the keynote to the whole of our vast subject and places us at the very outset at the springs of that long narration on which we are now entering. Protestantism is not solely the outcome of human progress. It is no mere principle of perfectibility inherent in humanity and ranking as one of its native powers in which... uh, in which, in virtue of which, when society becomes corrupt, it can purify itself, and when it is arrested in its course by some external force or stops from exhaustion, it can recruit its energies and set forward anew on its path. It is neither a product of the individual reason nor the result of the joint thought and energies of the species. Protestantism is a principle which has its origin outside human society. It is a divine graft on the intellectual and moral nature of man, whereby new vitalities and forces are introduced into it, and the human stem yields forth a nobler fruit. It is the descent of a heaven-born influence which allies itself with the instincts and powers of the individual, with all the laws and cravings of society, and which, quickening both the individual and the social being into new life and directing their efforts to nobler objects, permits the highest development of which humanity is capable and the fullest possible accomplishment of all its grand ends. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity. Okay? So that ends the first little uh, chapter. And now we have uh, the Emperor Constantine the Great. And uh, the Emperor, what does it say? Mm, This is a little art piece of artwork here. Um, View of Constantinople, of course. Pretty cool to look at these old drawings. Very, very descript of uh, what what once was there in, uh, I believe, in Turkey, yeah? Constantinople. Yeah, later called uh, Istanbul, if I remember correctly. Istanbul, yeah. correct, yes. Yeah. So, like all, uh, here like we all are. big cities uh, nearby a river, of course, for trade. Yeah, so we're at chapter water two, supply. Michael. The declination or the declension of the early Christian church. Although from the 5th to the 15th century, the lamp of truth burned dimly in the sanctuary of Christendom. Its flame often sank low and appeared to expire, yet never did it wholly go out. God remembered his covenant with the light and set bounds to to the darkness. Not only had this heaven-kindled lamp its period of waxing and waning, like those illuminaries that God has placed on high, but like them, too, it had its appointed circuit to accomplish. Now it was, the, uh, was on the cities of northern Italy 
that its light was seen to fall, and now its rays illuminated the plains of southern France. Now it shone along the course of the Danube and the Moldau, or tinted the pale shores of England, or shed its glory upon the Scottish Hebrides. Now it was the uh, it was on the summits of the Alps that it was seen to burn, spreading a gracious morning on the mountain tops and giving promise of the sure approach of day. Then anon. It would bury itself in the deep valleys of Piedmont and seek shelter from the fierce tempests of persecution behind the great rocks and the eternal snows of the everlasting hills. Let us briefly trace the growth of this truth to the days of Wycliffe. The spread of Christianity during the first three centuries was rapid and extensive, the main causes that contributed to this were the translation of the scriptures into the languages of the Roman world, the fidelity and zeal of the preachers of the gospel, and the heroic de deaths of the martyrs. It was the success of Christianity that the first set limits to its progress. That first set limits to its progress, excuse me. It had received a terrible blow, it is true, under Diocletian. This, which was the most terrible of all earlier persecutions, had in the brief of the pagans utterly exterminated the Christian superstition so far from this. It had but afforded the gospel an opportunity of giving to the world a mightier proof of its divinity. It rose from the stakes and massacres of Diocletian to begin a new career in which it was destined to triumph over the empire which thought that it had crushed it. Dignities and wealth now flowed upon its ministers and disciples according to the uniform testimony of all the early historians. The faith which had maintained its purity and rigor in the humble sanctuaries and lowly position of the first age and amid the fires of its pagan persecutors became corrupt and wax feeble amid the gorgeous temples and the worldly dignities which imperial favor had lavished upon it. From the fourth century, the corruptions of the Christian church continued to make marked the rapid progress, the Bible began to be hidden from the people, and in proportion as the light, which is the surest guarantee of liberty, was withdrawn, the clergy usur usurped authority over the members of the church. The canons of councils were put in the room of the infallible rule of faith. And thus, the first stone was laid in the foundations of, quote, Babylon, that great city that made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, unquote. Wow, the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It's not just the wine of her fornication. It's the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the wrath of her fornication, would that be the law? <laughs> you know, man's law versus God's law. You know, we talked about earlier about, you know, the, the law being, uh, uh, the commandment being a lamp and the light being law. God's law, God's perfect law. The ministers of Christ began to affect titles of dignity and to extend their authority and jurisdiction to temporal matters, forgetful that an office bestowed by God and serviceable to the highest interest of society 
can never fail of respect when filled by men of exemplary character sincerely devoted to the discharge of its duties. The beginning of this matter seemed innocent enough. To to obviate pleas before the secular tribunals, ministers were frequently asked to attribute in disputes between members of the church, and Constantine made a law confirming all such decisions in the consistories of the clergy and shutting out the review of their sentences by civil judges. Proceeding in this fatal path, the next step was to form the external polity of the church upon the model of civil government. Four vice-kings or prefects governed the Roman Empire under Constantine, and why, it was asked, should not a similar arrangement be introduced into the church? Accordingly, the Christian world was divided into four great dioceses. Over each diocese was set a patriarch who governed the whole clergy of his domain and thus arose four great thrones or princedoms in the house of God. Where there had been a brotherhood, there was now a hierarchy, and from the lofty chair of the patriarch, a gradation of rank, a subordination of authority and office, ran down to the lovely or to the lowly state and contracted sphere of the presbyter, it was splendor of rank rather than the fame of learning and the luster of virtue that henceforward conferred distinction on the ministers of the church. Such an arrangement was not fitted to nourish spirituality of mind or humility of disposition or peacefulness of temper. The enmity and violence of the persecutor the clergy had no longer cause to dread, but the spirit of faction which now took possession of the dignitaries of the church awakened vehement disputes and fierce contentions which disparaged the authority and sullied the glory of the sacred office. The emperor himself was witness to these unseemly spectacles. Quote, I entreat you, unquote. We find him pathetically saying to the fathers of the Council of Nice, quote, Beloved ministers of God and servants of our, Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, take away the, claw, uh, the cause of our dissension and disgracement. Establish peace among yourselves. Unquote. While the quote-unquote living oracles were neglected, the zeal of the clergy began to spend itself, itself upon rites, that is, rituals and ceremonies, borrowed from the pagans. These were multiplied to such a degree that Augustine accompanied that they were, quote, less tolerable than the yoke of the Jews under the law, unquote. At this period, the bishops of Rome wore costly attire, gave sumptuous banquets, and when they went abroad, were carried in litters. They now began to speak with an authoritative voice and to demand obedience from all the churches. Of this, the dispute between the Eastern and Western churches respecting Easter is an instance in point. The Eastern Church, following the Jews, kept the feast on the 14th day of Nisan, the day of the Jewish Passover. The churches of the West, especially that of Rome, kept Easter on the Sabbath following the 14th day of Nisan. 
Victor, Bishop of Rome, resolved to put an end to the controversy and accordingly sustained himself sole judge in this weighty point. He commanded all the churches to observe the feast on the same day with himself. The churches of the East, not aware that the Bishop of Rome had authority to command their obedience in this or in any other matter, kept Easter as before, and for this flagrant contempt, as Victor accounted, of, the, of his legitimate authority, he excommunicated them. They refused to obey a human ordinance, and they were shut out from the kingdom of the gospel. This was the first peal of those thunders which were in after times to roll so often and so terribly from the seven hills. Riches, flattery, deference continued to wait upon the Bishop of Rome. The emperor saluted him as father. Foreign churches sustained him as judge in their disputes. Heresiarchs, excuse me, heresiarchs, sometimes fled to him for sanctuary. Those who had favors to beg extolled his piety or affected, affected, his, affected to follow his customs. And it is not surprising that his pride and ambition fed by continual incense continued to grow till at last the presbyter of Rome from being a vigilant pastor of a single congregation before whom he went in and out, teaching them from house to house, preaching to them the word of life, serving the Lord with all humility in many tears and temptations that befell him, raised his seat above his equals, mounted the throne of the patriarch, and exercised lordship, over the heritage of Christ. The gates of the sanctuary once forced, the stream of corruption continued to flow with ever-deepening volume. The declinations in doctrine and worship already introduced had changed the brightness of the church's morning into twilight. The descent of the northern nations, which, beginning in the 5th, continued through several successive centuries, converted that twilight into night. The new tribes had changed their country, but not their superstitions, and, unhappily, there was neither zeal nor vigor in the Christianity of the age to affect their instruction and their genuine conversion. The Bible had been withdrawn. In the pulpit, fable and usurped the place of truth, holy lives, whose silent eloquence might have won upon the barbarians, were rarely exemplified, and thus, instead of the church dispensate, uh, excuse me, Instead of the church dissipating the superstitions that now encompassed her like a cloud, these superstitions all but quenched the, her own light. She opened her gates to receive the new peoples as they were. She sprinkled them with baptismal water. She inscribed their names in her register. She taught them in their invocations to repeat the titles of the Trinity. But the doctrines of the gospel, which alone can enlighten the understanding, purify the heart, and enrich the life with virtue, she was little careful to inculcate upon them. She folded them with her pail, but they were scarcely more Christian than before while she was greatly so, uh, less so. From the 6th century downwards, Christianity was a mongrel system 
made up of pagan rites, revived from classic times, of superstitions imported from the forests of northern Germany and of Christian beliefs and observances which continued to linger in the church from primitive and purer times. The inward power of religion was lost, and it was in vain that men strove to supply its place by the outward form. They nourished their piety not at the living fountains of truth, but at the quote-unquote beggarly elements of ceremonies and relics, of consecrated lights and holy vestments. Nor was it divine knowledge only that was contemned. Men forbore to cultivate letters and, or to practice virtue, Baronius confessions, or no, Baronius confesses that in the sixth century, few in Italy were skilled in both Greek and Latin. Nay, even Gregory the Great acknowledged that he was ignorant of Greek. Quote, the main qualifications of the clergy were that they should be able to read well, sing their matins, know the Lord's prayer, psalter, forms of exorcism, and understand to compute the times of sacred festivals. Nor were they very sufficient for this, if we may believe the account some have given of them. Musculius says that many of them never saw the scriptures in their lives, in all their lives. It, excuse me, it would seem incredible, but it is delivered by no less an authority than Alma that an archbishop of Mainz, lighting upon a Bible and looking into it, expressed himself thus, quote, of a truth I do not know what book this is, but I perceive everything in it is against us. Unquote. Apostasy is like the descent of heavenly bodies, it proceeds with ever accelerating velocity. First, Lamps were lighted at the tombs of the martyrs. Next, the Lord's Supper was celebrated at their graves. Next, prayers were offered or them and to them. Next, paintings and images began to disfigure the walls and corpses to pollute the floors of the churches. Baptism, which apostle apostles required water only to dispense, could not be celebrated without white robes and car, uh, chrism, milk, honey, and salt. They came, uh, then came a crowd of church officers whose names and numbers are in striking contrast to the few and simple orders of men who were employed in the first propagation of Christianity. There were subdeacons, acolytes, exorcists, readers, uh, choristers, and porters, and as work must be found for this multi-host of laborers, there came to be fasts and exorcisms, there were lamps to be lighted, altars to be arranged, and churches to be consecrated. There was the Eucharist to be carried to the dying, and there were the dead to be buried, for which a special order of men was set apart. When one looked back to the simplicity of early times, it could not but amaze one to think. What a cum uh, cumbrous array of curious machinery and costly furniture was now needed for the service of Christianity. Not more stinging 
than true was the remark that, quote, when the church had golden chalices, she had wooden priests, unquote. So far, and through these various stages, had the declination of the church proceeded, the point she had now reached may be termed as uh, termed an apocal one. From the line on which she stood, there was no going back. She must advance into the new and unknown regions before her, though every step would carry her father from the simple form and vigorous life of her early days. Let me read that sentence again. The point which she had now reached may be termed an apocal one. From the line on which she, she stood, there was no going back. She must advance into the new and unknown regions before her, though every step would carry her farther from the simple form and vigorous life for her early days. She had received a new impregnation from an alien principle, the same, in fact, from which had sprung the great system that converted the earth before Christianity arose. This principle could not be summarily extirpated. It must run its course. It must develop itself logically, and having in the course of centuries brought its fruits to maturity, then it would then, but not till then, perish and pass away. Looking back at this stage to the change which had come over the church, we cannot fail to see that its deepest originating cause must be sought in the inability of the world to receive the gospel in all its greatness. It was a boon too mighty and too free to be easily understood or credited by man. The angels in, uh, excuse me, yes, the angels in their midnight song in the Vale of Bethlehem had defined it briefly as sublimely, quote unquote, goodwill to man. Its greatest preacher, the Apostle Paul, Paul, its greatest preacher, the Apostle Paul, had no other definition to give it. It was not even a rule of life, but, quote-unquote, grace, the, quote-unquote, grace of God, and therefore sovereign and boundless. To man fallen and undone, the gospel offered a full forgiveness and a complete spiritual renovation, issuing at length in the in inconceivable and infinite felicity of the etern of life eternal. But man's narrow heart could not enlarge itself to God's vast beneficence. A good, so immense, so complete in its nature and so boundless in its extent, he could not believe that God would be bestow without money and without price. There must be conditions or qualifications. So he reasoned, and hence it is the moment inspired men cease to address us. Excuse me. And hence it is that the moment inspired men cease to address us and that their disciples and scholars take their, uh, take their place, men of apostolic spirit and doctrine, no doubt, but without the direct knowledge of their predecessors, we become sensible of a change and eclipse has passed upon the exceeding glory of the gospel. As we pass from Paul to Clement, and from Clement to the fathers that succeeded him, we find 
the gospel becoming less of grace and more of merit. The light wanes as we travel down the patri- uh, patristic road and remove ourselves farther from the apost- uh, apostolic dawn. It continues for some time at least to be the same gospel, but it is its glory is shorn, uh, yeah, shorn. Its mighty force is abated, and we are reminded of the change that seems to pass upon the sun when after contemplating him in a tropical sphere, hemisphere, excuse me, we see him in a northern sky where he is slanting where his slanting beams, forcing their way through the mists and vapors, are robbed of half their splendor. Seen through the fogs of the patristic age, the gospel scarcely looks the same, which had burst upon the world with a, without a cloud but a few centuries before. This disposition, that of making God less free, in his gift, and man less dependent in the reception of it, the desire to introduce the element of merit on the side of man and the element of condition on the side of God operated at last in opening the door for the pagan principle to creep back into the church a change of deadly of a deadly and subtle kind passed upon the worship instead of being the spontaneous thanksgiving and joy of the soul that no more evoked the rapid oh uh, excuse me that evoked or repaid the blessings which awakened that joy than the odors which the flowers exhale are the cause of their growth or the joy that kindles in the heart of man when the sun arises is the cause of his rising rising worship we say from being the expression of the soul's emotions was changed into a rite a rite akin to those of Jewish temples and still more akin to those of Greek mythology, a rite in which lay couched a certain amount of human merit and inherent efficiency, efficacy, excuse me, that partly created, partly applied the blessings with which it stood connected. This was the moment when the pagan virus inculcated the Christian institution. This change brought a multitude of others on its train, worship being transformed into sacrifice, sacrifice in which the element of expiation and purification, the quote-unquote teaching ministry, was, of course, converted into a, quote, sacrificing priesthood, unquote. When this had been done, there was no, uh, there was no retreating. A boundary had been reached, which could not be recrossed till centuries had rolled away and transformations of a more portentous kind than any which had yet taken place had passed upon the church. Okay, and I think we made it through chapter 2. So now we have visit of Charlemagne to the Pope. Okay. And the penance of Henry the Sixth of Germany at Canossa. Okay. Okay, so Michael, you still with me? (laughs) (laughs) 
That's an affirmative, I take it? Yes, 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 I'm still with you. Would you like to proceed? Because it's uh, it's the time that usually Daryl shows up and we have recorded more than one hour already. Oh, wonderful. Well, then we'll call it... Uh, yeah, we'll please please it check it. My, my indication says one hour and 40 minutes in the call, so... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Sounds I good. I guess... It's perfect time to end, actually. And we'll uh, we'll leave the the next reading for next time, God willing. Mm -hmm. We're back, and um, yeah, I didn't hear much comments from you, Michael, on that last um, chapter. Yeah, that has a specific reason because my mother called me on the phone. So ah ha ha, yes, okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I mean, this is just uh, really interesting, nonetheless, because. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the words <laughs> in in here are uh, words that I have read very little in the past, and uh, it's interesting to uh, to read a, a book from 160, 70 years ago and uh, do do a discussion on it with you, Michael, because uh, yeah, I told you in the beginning, yeah, that I had to look up some words in the meantime. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure, I should be too. Um, uh, problem is, I I haven't taken the time to read this in advance, of course. Uh, shame on me, but um, yeah, quite frankly, I don't think I'd do a reading of it. Uh, if I didn't just go ahead and go ahead and try doing it, um, but anyway, Michael, yeah, let's let's call it quits for today on this topic, and we'll pick up next time where we left off, unless you have any comments. Which you don't, so uh, we'll just uh, we'll call it good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brett. I'm looking forward to the next time. And I hope that uh, some people will really appreciate these old books because uh, you see that uh, the Rome never changes and it's nothing new under the sun. So actually you find much truth in these old books, most likely much more than in the uh, actual internet these days. I agree with you, Michael. I think it's a really good thing to get back to the basics and... Uh start doing sessions like this on more of a, uh, at least a, a once every month, at least, I would say, would be good. Uh, we'll see if we can keep it up, but uh, there's a huge amount of material in this book, for sure. And we wish to continue, and we'll see, God willing, what is in store next time. I hope to catch you then. God bless. Maranatha. Okay, I'm just shutting off the Perfect. recording. Good. The chorus, I had to look it up. I said, what's a chorus? And then, okay, yeah, people singing a chorus. Yeah, great. That's, uh, I never came across that word, for example. All right, so we'll call uh, Daryl then. Could you wait 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll wait.